Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at William Sausage, the home of authentic country goodness and family-owned and operated since 1958, right here in Tennessee. Today's guest will have you inspired, motivated, and ready to pursue your passions and dreams. Seth Dorch talks with Scott about his love for the outdoors, using his God-given talents in his career through social media and photography, his faith, as well as sharing his personal life motto, to live slowly. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. I'm Scott Williams, and we record our podcast here every single week here in beautiful West Tennessee. Our podcast, just like our museum and Heritage Park, is dedicated to celebrating our unique Southern culture, spirit, and accomplishments. And I have a very special guest here today. Seth Dorch does so many things, I don't know how to describe him. I'm just going to go by his Instagram description. He's a creative professional, outdoorsman, ambassador, and he is Tennessee-based. Welcome, Seth. Man, I'm so stoked to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. So, so are you from, where are you from? Where, sure. where does Seth start off? Great question. So I was born and raised in Milan, Tennessee, um, grown up in Northwest Tennessee my whole life. And through that, uh, obviously I transferred from UT Martin once I came to college and went to MTSU. Um, so being in Murfreesboro, more metro area was awesome. Fantastic. It really took me into a deeper learning of people and out of just the cultural bubble of like, hey, this is how we've always done things. So coming back, and that's really where I'm at presently now. We live back in Milan. Heather, my wife and I, we live back in Milan right now. So it's been cool to come back and bring the changes. And so you grew up in in like the town or on a farm. How, how were you born under a duck nest? Sure. Where- yeah. So uh, waterfowl hunting. Hunting was my initiation to the outdoors. Uh, my dad, so going back into the Dorch heritage of waterfowl hunting, primarily that's what they did, bird hunting. And we um, have a lot of time, so yeah, we, no, we want to go back good, to good. the heritage, uh, you know, so all the way back. Obine River system um, runs right throughout all of northwest Tennessee, eventually flows into the Mississippi River. My great uncle, Herman Dorch, there's a, a, a duck club that's still fully operating now. It's called Davy Crockett Hunting Club, and it's located probably 35 minutes from here. My whole Dorch side of the family grew up in Martin. My great uncle, Herman, he was a guide for Davy Crockett Hunting Club. So the guys that started it, they were a bunch of guys out of Nashville, wanted a place to come in West Tennessee because West Tennessee is just awesome waterfowl hunting. And what, what year are we so in So this right is now? 1960s. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is going you know, way before I was, you know, in notion. Sure. Um, so my Uncle Herman was a guide there. And then that is the waterfowling mentor to my dad, Lee Dorch, which who taught me, initiated with me. And from there, as I was initiated through waterfowl hunting into the outdoors, into nature, creation, it, it just, you know, it's come from there of growing a, a heart that just longs to be in the wild, whether it's duck hunting, whether it's fly fishing, any type of hunting, anything. Um, and so progression of that, it was all, it all happened right here, really in the real foot region um, of West Tennessee and how that has all kind of evolved for me. And that's a huge passion that I have for this area and helping tell the narrative and the story of how rich our culture is here. And I, all, all kinds of different categories, whether it's farming, hunting, outdoors, assets that we have within the land. Um, and yeah, that's kind of how I got initiated into it. And so, so you're the perfect person for a lot of people listening because we have listeners from all over the world. So a lot of people may not know what waterfi- waterfowl hunting really is. So take yeah. us take us through when you first put your waterfowl hunting boots on yeah. to when you fry those ducks up in the pan. Absolutely. Take man. us through the process. Yeah, so... Oh, gosh. So from a waterfowl hunt in itself, so species, you got ducks, you got geese, um, and now you've got like cranes and things like that. Um, Primarily around here is duck and goose hunting, more so duck hunting. Um, West Tennessee is primarily known for river bottoms, duck hunting, whether that's hunting a duck blind or whether that's hugging a tree with a couple decoys, kicking your feet to make some ripple on the water and let them know you're there. Um, So through that, the season, you got a 60-day season here in Tennessee, okay. and 
even though you've got a 60 day season, the preparation like never stops for, and this is for a honey, anything that's anybody that's passionate about something that they're pursuing, the preparation for it never stops. So, so all year long, you're, you're, oh, buying, yeah, you're buying stuff. Which, so for me, even though more so for my dad specifically, that's, that's all he really did was waterfowl hunt. So his mentality was more focused into that. For me, it's a little bit different because as waterfowl season is ending, okay, then you got springtime that's coming, fly fishing, turkey hunting. So my my mind is kind of shifting, but it's all evolving around the hunting space, fishing space, things like that. And deer hunting, that's coming up, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I just so I'm brand new greenhorn to deer hunting. I killed my first one last year. Um, and that's been super cool because even with me working in the outdoor space and potentially the perspective that some may have towards me if they see the work that I do or if they follow me on my social media accounts that think I have all these answers or know how to do everything within hunting, I don't. And it's been really humbling for me to learn something new in the realm of the space that I work in because I think it really reveals to people everybody starts from somewhere. Everybody has somebody that helps them initiate into some type of learning. So for hunting, whether it was duck hunting for me with my dad, whether it's deer hunting for a couple of different mentors of mine. Um, but flip side, to go back to, to the overall duck hunting itself, um, it can range anywhere from waking up Depending on where you live, how far you got to drive, commute, all that. Yeah, if you um, live if you live around here, you don't have to drive right. far. Yeah, so thankfully, Final Flight has a lodge that I stay at um, during duck season a lot, um, and they've got a hunt club that they allow us to to hunt with them, um, and it's super it's convenient. But also, I don't want to allow that conveniency to to allow me to grow complacent to just like oh you know this is just the usual because really it's really special. Because um, I see a lot of people, I, you know, not a lot, but I see some people driving down the road right with a boat behind them full of branches and stuff. And Absolutely. The, so that, the first time I saw that, I thought, oh, they must have been cleaning up their yard yeah. and they're taking their branches to the dump and yeah. they're using their boat. That's kind of weird. <laughs> Dude, and you can't ever tell, though. I mean, and the, gosh, I've seen blinds brush with all kinds of different stuff. But, yeah, it it, it really is a never-ending process to, to do it well. Um, and I, I think that's something that I've learned, even in the waterfowling community, not only as being a hunter, but also a creative for it. So of telling the story of the waterfowling community, uh, of telling the story through through written, so whether it's articles or photography, video, anything like that, uh, talking about it's cool to see somebody so passionate to where they'll do whatever they got to do to make sure that they do it well, even if it doesn't get noticed. And people may be seeing from the outside looking in, like, what in the world are they doing? For, if, for example, like you've seen a boat go down the road, um, but the work is just constantly going to be able to do it well. So those folks that are tooling down the road, you know, going to go hunt, they have, right. got, they have invested in the right clothing, the right apparel, the right... Potentially. <laughs> you know, hopefully, right. they've, you know, through the years, they've invested yeah. in the right... And they've practiced, so they know how to shoot, and right. you know they're ready to go. So you get to um, Real Foot Lake. Mm-hmm. What happens next? So typically at Real Foot, most people that go and hunt the lake, um, unless you're from around here. So Real Foot Lake is such a primary attractant of Tennessee tourism in itself for for hunting um, because there's so many different guides and even so for final flight we have a guide program to where we partner with incentive and discount to the guides um, to bring their clients to us but then also that we can equip them well and that way they can hunt well with whoever guide they're hunting with Um, so but at real foot you're typically getting in a boat um, somewhere around 4 a.m., 4.30-ish a.m. It's cold, um, probably. Absolutely, yeah. And it, it could – that's the thing about the lake, man, is one day it could be – so Thursday I was riding around, um, and so Real Foot is super rich with refuges that, that surround it. Um, so you've got the National Wildlife Refuge, and then you also have state, state refuges as well. So not only is that great for a hunter, for holding birds, but also for me being a photographer, I just go and camp out for about four hours and take photos of birds. Um, so Thursday, I was riding around, and it was raining that morning, and it was 60-ish degrees. It dropped like 14 degrees as we got a cold front that came through, and then sat, what day was it? 
m- maybe Monday, I saw David Haggard post uh, pictures of trees that had ice formations. Mm-hmm. So, it, I mean, it could, you could be out on the lake one day uh, during the morning, cold front come through, and it'd be 30 degrees different. So that's part of the pursuit and part of being at the ha- at really just in the elements is that it could change. And just as much so as being a waterfowl hunter, you want to prepare as much as you can. There comes a point to where – you, you can't you can't control the element so it could completely change um, but yeah roll out in a boat 430 go to a duck blind typically most and some the duck blind is located where so duck blind is located either in the timber um, so within hardwoods um, typically your hole will be your your kill hole like your duck hole will be smaller or it's in the open water um, so they'll either say they're back in the woods or they're out on the open water um, and a blind on the open water is you hunt it differently than you would hunting a blind within the woods because and, I was I was at Blue Bank Resort um, and I yeah. asked Mike, you know, just so I'd sound cool. You know, how are the you know are the ducks? Right, are how's the it ducks, going, man? Are the ducks out? <laughs> yeah. Are the ducks out today? You know, and he said they were not because they were out in the fields. Yeah, because they had no one had rushed them into the water yet. Right, something yeah. like that. And that's so the thing about the lake is it's surrounded by by farm ground, agriculture ground. So you've got crops. Some people leave crop. Uh, throughout the hunting season so that way they'll hold more birds some people so for production agriculture you know most are harvesting picking their corn soybeans whatever it may be for production Uh, but then you have several duck farms that are leaving food leaving the habitat habitat management on their ground and that all plays into effect and even with the refuges is they're managing that habitat and that land specifically for for game and whether it's deer, whether it's waterfowl, whatever it may be. So that goes into effect because sometimes they may have more birds and the lake will have less. And then also on the flip side, the lake may more have birds and the fields will have less. Um, a huge part of real foot is you'll hit if, if you hit, listen to them, like they'll talk about where the birds are crossing. So waterfowl, they'll go feed. So they have a roosting location and then they also have a feeding location. Um, and when it gets super cold that they may very roost exactly where they're feeding at. Cause they, if they're in water, they don't want to leave their hole cause it'll freeze up kind of what we were talking about with ice eaters. Um, or if they're on dry ground, they'll dry feed, but birds will cross the lake at certain points. So whether it's on the North end or the South end, so towards the South end, blinds or guides that are really doing well um, with bird counts may be doing way better than the north end and it's just it's the same lake same region but totally different hunting uh, in just two different areas so, so do people find out on social media oh, hey yeah. it's better over there so yeah, you well, move and well so that's an, uh, the lake has awful service so right, terrible exactly terrible and service. that's one thing mike hayes will try to hit i was up there when, what day was it? This past week, and he was he was asking me. He was like, "You know anything about like cell towers?" And I was like, "Yeah, Man, rural, I, rural broadband." I, yeah, I was like, "I have no idea." Um, but yeah, so some people will post if they have service, um, and that's been a huge part of social media. That's a whole conversation in itself um, with how it's changed. Well, we're gonna the, get there. Yeah, yeah. Of how Just cause I you're hope a so. social media I hope so. guru. <laughs> yeah, how so it's gonna, sh- how it's changed the outdoor space in general. Right. If, this is know. gonna be like a six part block. Hey, I'm so, down, man. I'm down. Yeah, six part episode. Those are great okay. questions, man. And it's, it is cool because especially hearing questions from you, you're such a curious guy, um, and I love all your questions, even with you're raising and knowing more your backstory of like being really curious like, man, like mm-hmm. what's this like like what's this experience what's this like what's it like of what y'all do and uh, that's awesome here's the here's the, the next question is is it just like when it's cold how is it not miserable when you're out there wet cold yeah. icy great question um it is miserable <laughs> <laughs> so i man when i first started hunting uh, I, there's specific mornings and even photos that my dad has to where I'm just like, what was I doing out there? Um, I can, my dad took me to Ohio one year, which is where I killed my first waterfowl ever. It was a Canada goose. Um, and it was so cold that I couldn't load my gun or anything. The guides had to load it, which I was 10. Um, but still it was literally so cold and it, it's a good, it's a good de- description and it really like opens up a whole conversation itself of when you're passionate about something or you have a love for something that you're doing, 
no matter what the circumstances may be, you'll persevere through those circumstances to see the end goal. Um, and that's been so true to, to be able to grow up in the hunting community and the fishing community that a lot of the elements or conditions, so when it may be freezing cold and you've got a cold front coming through and it's snowing and you can't even feel your fingers and, and all of that, they're still out there doing it. And because they have a greater love and passion for what they're doing rather than just what their feelings and emotions are for it. So yeah. Now, do, you have, do you have any siblings? Yeah, I've got two older sisters. Okay. Do, do either of them hunt? So my oldest sister, um, growing up, she was somewhat interested in it. She was definitely more of the the tomboy of the family. She, she had a bad experience with shooting a gun one time. So if you don't shoulder your gun right, any gun, no matter what you shoot, has some type of kick let off. And when you don't shoulder it right, either it'll pop you in the nose, it'll pop you in the mm. cheek, whatever it may be. Um, so that kind of gave her a bad taste um, at an early age. But she ended up marrying a hunter. And oh. so that is so now they have two nieces, or I have two nieces. They've got two daughters that we're. I feel like that's the only presents that Heather, my wife, and I get for them is a fishing pole or something for hunting or anything like that. So that's helped. But she, and then my middle sister, Katie, she is totally like the fashionista of the Dorch clan. She would dress me growing up, like pick out all my style, all that. Um, but even now, she's, we're probably going to take her either this year at some point because she's super interested in just getting outdoors, like really seeing what it's like. Um, I think that's such a huge part of the hunting experience is there's so many different variables that go into play, um, but it's just initiating opportunity for somebody to see what they think of it. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, people can develop, oh, they grew up in that family. They should be hardcore hunters. Well, that's not the case. Like there's different perspective. We all enjoy different things. We all have different things that really get our gears going. And so for my two sisters, they're not just hardcore hunters. Um, then on like the flip side, Heather, my wife, she grew up hunting as well. Um, but not waterfowl hunting, deer hunting and turkey hunting. And this past year, she just killed her first duck, which was the the photo in the, the Ducks Unlimited publication. Mm -hmm. And that's been a crazy experience for me because even growing up in, in what – she is just now learning, seeing her gears get going for it, start asking more questions, taking more initiative, like, hey, is this gear good? Or, hey, what do you think? Like, she'll, say, she'll ask me questions about migration or anything like that, and I'm just like, where did that come from? But I'm, I can tell she's like, she actually enjoys it. And she obviously doesn't have the bug as bad as I do, um, but it's so awesome to experience that with her. So, yeah, that, uh, two older sisters, they enjoy the outdoors, but just in different ways than I do. You alone are a lifestyle brand. Uh, you combine your wife together with you. The two of you <laughs> are like the dynamic duo lifestyle she, brand. She is uh, she's a huge asset. <laughs> and so, um, you know, like I look at social, you know, of course I follow all your social medias, right. um, which – you know, you're, Seth Dorch is easy to find on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and you've got a website and a blog. Yes. Um, and so, you know, you really do that well. Is that just instinctual or did you, what, what was your major? Or? Yeah, so my major in college was agriculture business. And that, even as I was graduating before I came back full-time at Final Flight, that was a huge pivotal decision of a season in my life. Uh, am I going to go full-time agriculture or am I going to go full-time outdoor industry, not really knowing what it looks like? And what did your parent, what, what was your parents' job? So, so my dad, uh, so the Dorch family is primarily known for roofing. Um, that's all my dad's ever done is work in the roofing industry going from, they owned a actual roofing company. Um, I don't know what year they sold it. And then he went into distribution. So working out of Memphis, um, he's worked in Memphis for probably 20 years, something like that. And then my mom, um, she was a stay-at-home mom all the way up until, I guess, about six years ago. And then she is now, she works for CBN, so Christian Broadcasting Network. And she basically, if you are if you call up there, she'll pray for you. Um, so it's it's pretty cool. Um, and so she that's always been her heart is more so counseling, finding out people's life circumstances and how to help them maximize potential, capitalize on opportunity and learn how to do that. So growing up, I mean, you know, I wasn't from an agricultural background. I'd always, I guess, had a heart of helping people, um, telling story, uh, t telling people's story. 
from an early age when I killed my first goose that I was telling you about earlier. My dad helped me write my first ever publication that got put into a, a magazine. And that was, I didn't realize it then. I realize it now. Um, that was kind of my first Lo- like growing in the love that I have for words and visual. So creative services, photography, videography, creating articles to tell a story of whether it's a hunt, to tell a story of a brand, to tell a story of an organization, an individual, a family, um, because we all have incredible stories. Like I truly believe that. And really, the more that I live, the more I realize that. But a lot of times it can be hard to try to break that down and just be real and raw and know how to connect with people. And so that's that's really what I do now and something that I love so much is just saying like, hey, what's your story? Like whether you're just an individual that I'm hunting with, whether you're a brand, say, and just finding out ways how I can better communicate that for people and, and help people understand like that – because even now, like, man, your story personally, Discovery Park of America, all that, like, there's so much backstory to get to the the places that you're at presently. Um, and even for me of what I'm doing now for a career, there's so much backstory of, I was telling Katie earlier, just a progression of people initiating opportunities for me, a lot of failure, a lot of I don't know how to do this, but I, I really just want to learn. Um, I don't know what that process looks like, uh, but I'm just going to reach out to some people and not even really know how to communicate what I'm trying to do, but just say like, hey, here's my ambition. I just need help trying to figure it out. Um, so when I transferred to MTSU, the differences between MTSU and UT Martin for me is you have to have a minor at MTSU rather at UT Martin, you can just do, so I was doing a major in agriculture business. So I was going to do journalism at MTSU, but the hours didn't line up, things like that. So I chose uh, film and digital photography. And I'd always had an appreciation of photos and especially growing up looking, you know, I can remember laying in the floor, looking at publications and articles and trying to learn not only to make me a better hunter or, or angler, but also like, man, just the visual like connection that you have, whether it's a photo of somebody hunting, whatever it may be. Um, so learning the tool of learning, like, running a camera and post editing and ha- developing my photography vision, all of that has equipped me with the ability to combine that what I truly believe is a God-given talent of helping learn people's story, put it into a way that you can get it out on a platform, get it deployed, whether that's through written, whether that's through digital, so social media, anything like that, and seeing it come full circle for people. Um, so it's been definitely a journey of so many ways of like, man, what direction am I headed? Um, but then just things clicking along the way. Um, and really to go back to your question, Eric, there's a huge question within the creative space is creativity, whether that's more in regards to art or marketing, like practical steps of marketing, is that more learned or is it more just they're born with it? And I I truly believe it's both. Um, You can have a God-given talent, but do nothing with it. But then on the flip side, you could have no talent at all and work harder than anybody else and learn how to do it really, really well and be one of the leading persons in your industry. And that's really what I've really sought out to do and what I've had just so many people encourage me to do of affirmation like, man, you're really good at that. Well, that that makes a you know a flag go off in my head. Like, why am I good at this? How can I cultivate that? How can I use that to empower other people, to help other people learn, to teach other people? And so, really, that's what I'm trying to learn in right now. Well, because if you if you look at your if you look at your work, especially like on Instagram, you know, is where I see it most frequently. I mean, it looks like there's a there's a whole huge ad agency behind you. You know, <laughs> I mean, your stuff looks. Thank you. You know, man. and so so it's really um, and then you, now that you can include your wife, right. I'm just waiting for you guys to be able to include a whole bunch of little Seths. I, uh, man, we just got a dog and that's been learning in itself. Yeah, yeah. that's good. That's good. Someday, yeah. someday there'll be a bunch of little Seths. Or, yeah. What's your wife's name? Heather. Or Heather, little yep. Heathers. Um, but for now, um, so Heather is in the current um, issue of Ducks Unlimited. That's correct. Magazine. She, yep, she's in the, the December, January. How issue. did that come about? So... A guy named John Hoffman, he he works for Ducks Unlimited. Um, and an even backstory, um, so growing up, Ducks Unlimited, my perspective towards Ducks Unlimited, I, it's, a, it's a nonprofit organization that was developed in 
think it was 1936 is the exact exact year to grow conservation for waterfowl. Um, so all the way from the prairies of, of Canada, as they migrate down all the way into Mexico, South America, all of it, um, is to enhance and improve the overall waterfowl population, habitat, uh, breeding grounds, all of that. So as I've grown up within the hunting industry, you know, not necessarily industry, but as an outdoorsman, just so much appreciation for the work that they do, whether that's reading a magazine, whether, it, I mean, and really before social media, came, that was primarily their way of communicating those things. But then also you've got Ducks Unlimited chapters. So when I was at UT Martin for college, the the Martin Mallards is a chapter, a Ducks Unlimited chapter for our area, which we we've hosted here. Y'all have allowed us to have it here at Discovery Park of America, which which makes sense because there are ducks everywhere exactly, here. Exactly, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, growing up, my dad would take me to banquets and and all kinds of stuff like that, um, which really like piqued my interest. Like, wow, there's so much community to this. Like, this is really cool. I'll offer ducks. Um, so as I came to Martin, I had the opportunity to be the area chairman for that chapter, which taught me a lot of the ins and outs of DU. Just like with any other organization, no organization does anything perfect. Um, they, they're all learning. They're all learning how to do things better. Um, but the overall vision and mission is, is incredible and needed. Um, so as that's progressed of my connections within Ducks Unlimited and learning that John Hoffman is the photo editor for Ducks Unlimited and he is in the Final Flight Hunt Club so great friends of the powers um, and he is just he's taken so much initiative into just investing in me um, not trying to, to hand me anything but say like hey man if you know if you do the work um, and you you do everything like you know you've got potential there so through that, there's a photographer's list um, that Ducks Unlimited has that I was able to be added to. And so every time that they have an article get created in Vision, um, they send it out and say, like, hey, we're kind of looking for these photos. And this edition of Ducks Unlimited magazine was primarily focused on women in the outdoors, getting them engaged, getting them involved, because that's been a whole narrative that for so long – within the outdoor space of primarily being men, it's like, oh, you know, women need to know their place, men need to know theirs, but that's totally changing, especially with my generation. And it's been so cool for me to learn that even with Heather and be able to, to create content and story to, to help tell that narrative more like the outdoors isn't just a place for big burly men with long beards that, you know, that's what they've always done. Like it's an opportunity for anybody to connect with nature, to connect with the outdoors, whether you're a youth, whether you're a girl, a boy, a man, a woman. Um, and so that's what that, that article was put, was focused on. And, uh, just so happens last year, like I was saying, Heather killed her first duck. Um, it was a greenhead mallard that was just at a location that's very special to me um, with a group of guys out of the Final Flight Hunt Club that are just so awesome. And um, they allowed me to bring Heather with them and it's super open for her learning and getting engaged. And um, so, yeah, it's been it's been mind blowing, honestly, um, not only socially, but more so personally within my own heart, um, because growing up and watching something and engaging something that, man, it seems like such a far off dream to be published in, in Ducks Unlimited magazine. And then to be able to flip onto a page and see an image that I can remember my camera settings. I can remember the moment, like how cold it was. I can remember the emotion, the stoke around it. Uh, it's just, it's, it's crazy to process, honestly. And just honestly, just makes me thankful to have the opportunity, uh, not for self gain, but how can I take these experiences and provide opportunity for more people as my experience grows, as my um, so, somewhat, you know, career platform grows? How can I really look to not only just the younger generation, but the overall industry of how can I tell this narrative better and provide, not to put on a front, but to really say, like, hey, here's how special it is to so many people and how special it could be to so many others. So, so people who who don't duck hunt may not understand the correlation between duck hunting and conservation. Sure. And talking about Ducks Unlimited, talk a little bit yeah. more about the importance of conservation and where your head is yeah. when it comes to that. Yeah, man, that's a great question that has had a lot of tension 
ever since conservation became a really big effort. And that's not only for, for hunting, but, you know, if you go out west, you've got a lot of uh, BLM land. So land management, public land, all of that, um, and public land and, and not conservation effort in itself is so much more than just hunters. It's, uh, photographers, it's bird watchers, it's uh, recreational outdoor space, all of that, because it's all the same land um, and it's all the same species, but it's being engaged in and consumed from and in different ways. Um, so Ducks Unlimited initiative in that was a group of duck hunters that wanted to improve the habitat, improve the migration, improve bird counts, all of that. Um, and I, something that I've told a lot of people, anytime I've been in a very intense conversation in regards to perspective towards whether it's Ducks Unlimited or hunting in general. Um, you know, if there was no wildlife, there would be no hunting at all. You, like there's nothing to consume. There's nothing to pursue. Um, and I think that's even for me, something that you pursue that you love, you'll do whatever it takes to take care of it. Um, and that's a huge part of conservation efforts, whether it's conserving the land, whether it's conser conserving the wildlife, whatever it may be, that if you're pursuing them, um, whatever the intention is, some people, they pursue waterfowl just to get, just to kill. And some people pursue waterfowl to put food on the table. Some people, like whatever the motive is, there's still that action taking place. And without that, that product, like you, you can't do any of it. Um, and that's why it's so important. Conservation, connecting the dots between conservation and hunting is because in a sense, hunting is conservation from, from the flip side of, controlling populations, controlling habitat. And if you're a hunter, without the wildlife, like there's nothing for you to hunt. So you're going to do whatever you can above and beyond to take care of that wildlife, to, uh, to, to, to enhance their living situation, to enhance their migration abilities. What, and there's some things you can't control. You can't control elements, weather, predators. I mean, you can in some ways. Like So for Delta waterfowl, their focus is more on predator prevention. Um, they do this, you know, similar thing as Ducks Unlimited. Both are great conservation efforts, just different methods and how they go about it. Um, but that's, you know, Ducks Unlimited is so important um, regardless of what perspective is. Obviously, when you put a bunch of group, when you put a group of humans together in an organization, there's going to be mishaps, there's going to be screw ups, and as when you as your platform grows, when those screw ups happen, it gets more publicized, it becomes more apparent to people, um, and that's why you know I really encourage people to to not make your assumption just based off of one story you heard or one conversation that you had with a hunter or with somebody that works for a conservation organization um, because they're not just that one person. Like it's made up of, of a bunch of people that really care for what's going on and really invest in a lot of work, time, energy, resources into making sure that that grows for generations to come. Now, another organization that's involved in all of these things we've been talking about, you mentioned a few times, Final Flight. You actually work with that great team I there. Do, yeah. what, how long have you been there, and, and what's, you know, what, what are you doing for them these days? Yeah, um, growing up, Final Flight Outfitters Incorporated was my mall of America, like literally. So I was born in 95. They started the store, having a storefront in 98. Um, and from my earliest memories – when dad would tell me, hey, man, we're going to Final Flight this weekend, I mean, just stoke level out of this world, um, not only because of the environment that the company is, but also the powers like growing up there, you know, in my mind, they're almost like celebrities. Um, and now they're literally mentors, friends, in a sense, family to me. Um, so I started working there my freshman year at UT Martin, um, part-time and just so thankful for the opportunity to even work there. Like just, and, and it's so crazy because even as I've been there part-time and full-time combined, I guess almost, gosh, almost eight years. Um, and my, 
my passion, my love for for not only the the owners and the people that make up the culture, all of, like it continues to to just grow and grow and grow. And I, there's so much purpose in that, more so than I even can understand. Um, because I know even when I was a little kid, and we would come up, and I would be strolling through the racks, thinking like this is incredible. Um, I had no idea the plan that that the Lord would have for me to work there and to help create the culture there, to help market it, to to help hunters and outdoorsmen get their gear they need. Um, and that's, you know, even for Final Flight, it's such a huge part of it. We say your success is our success. Um, and it, within marketing, I've heard different definitions of marketing at times. One of the best definitions I ever heard was uh, Dr. Michael Park. He's still a professor right now for marketing at UT Martin, great mentor of mine. Um, but he said, meeting the needs of your customers. And when when you really like start picking things apart, our perspective of meeting the needs isn't just getting you the new gear. It's not just, you know, selling you what's hot and what's trendy, um, but it's actually generally growing a relationship with like the human heart and the human soul of like, Hey, you can depend on us. We may not always have the answers, but we generally care for you as a person, like getting to know who you are, like your family, whatever it may be. Um, so yeah, I've been there almost eight years and uh, in a lot of ways, I can't even fully articulate and communicate uh, how special Final Flight Outfitters is to me and the the Powers family and all they've pr- all the opportunity they've provided me with because um, a lot of what I do now within the outdoor space um, is a huge part. Like that's where I got a lot of my start and a lot of my learning. And so no matter where I go, what kind of work I do, who I'm working for, um, the location I live in, that that will always remain true for sure as I progress. Now, now you're doing all this. You're doing all these. You've got a lot of things going sure. on, but at the same time, you advocate for a slower, more mellow lifestyle, right? <laughs> I and do, man. You're live in slowly. my head all the time because whenever you I'm live like, slowly. whenever I'm working like too many hours in a day, I think, man, Seth would not yeah. be happy with my <laughs> lifestyle. Yeah, I do not have a Seth lifestyle right now. So, what, what to you? What, what is, what is the right, what, or what is the best way, the healthiest way we should be approaching work life balance? Sure, man. That's a great question that I think is becoming more talked about and more important. Um, and it's, gosh, man, out of any. And you, what is it you post? You post like slow down. Or, yeah, live slowly. Live uh, slowly. Yeah. So That's eventually, it. I'm definitely gonna get a tattoo of it. Uh, just live to remember, slowly. Yeah. I like that. And, yeah. And a whole lot. Of, see, what I want to do though with that is create more work for you. I think there should be a whole lot of apparel, like Seth Dortch live slowly I, apparel. I have to get some hats, mate. Yeah, hats. So you know, uh, whole brand. Man, these these are all you know personal things that have progressed to me as as I've experienced whether struggling seasons of whatever it may be, whether I'm just like exhausted or anxious or confused. Um, one of them was fish for folks, which I do have tattooed on me. Um, that came to me about my junior year in college. Um, as I was going through college, obviously we all have the thought of like, what's my purpose? Like what direction am I going? What's my calling? What's my abilities? And that's becoming even more of a greater conversation with mental health um, and how uh, prevalent that is becoming of people really having some like really deep struggles and not knowing how to navigate them, find help, anything like that. Um, So Fish for Folks, uh, that came to fruition that it just means a whole lot to me of kind of my purpose here of, you know, reaching people and and telling people the good news of the gospel. Um, And then Live Slowly came about because I, a lot similar to you, like, I don't want to be outworked. I don't want to be outdone. Uh, Not only, it's more, and it's more personal than it is just to beat somebody like it's it's really having the ambition to be the best at what we do and to be the leaders of what we're doing of I mean my problem is too is that I'm blessed that I ended up in a career that I love and right, so yeah, absolutely all parts of it I love doing and so six seven o'clock comes and I'm done with this one thing that was a blast to right. work on yeah and now there's this next thing that's a blast exactly. to work on and so I'm in a different stage of life fortunately I have a a wife who, right. you know, is sick of me already after 30 years. Already, already she's understands like, yeah, she's the like, process. Ah, you stay yeah. at work. You yeah. know, my kids are away at school. Yeah. You know, so I could just keep going, you know, yeah. and, but but that's not healthy long term. Sure. I don't want to burn out. 
So I, I'll sure. get, I need to get a tattoo as well. <laughs> so, you know. so yeah, so live slowly is just a simple reminder to me. So living, the, the word live is an action. Um, you can't live without taking action. And because the greatest thing that I don't want to communicate with people is like, hey, man, take a break. And then they grow complacent, lazy, no ambition, no drive. Um, and so that's why I live as a part of it is like living life. You know, you hear the, the words live life to the fullest. Um, I think it's more important to just live life with meaning, to live life with purpose and finding out what that is can be hard. Um, and our human innate like action is to almost work ourselves to the point of just exhaustion, which is not healthy. Right. Um, and so I want to I want to empower people to to work hard and if they've got an ambition put some action into it on the flip side to live life slowly from a standpoint of I don't want you to get to the end of your life and look back and say it was all just a blur um uh, and to really embrace the moments of whether it's a season in the valley where you're like just trying to to draw from the river of strength and direction or whether it's a season on the summit of a mountain to where you're just like on this career high or fam- personal, high, whatever it may be, um, and to really just em- embrace the whole process of what it may be. Because um, I think the more that we all learn how to do because nobody has it all fig- figured out in that fact, um, but the more we talk about it, the more we're, we're vulnerable in that, the more we realize, man, that – I'm not the only one that's feeling that way. I'm not the only one that wants to be the best, but also I don't want to work myself to death, Uh, you know? And so I've, especially with my generation to where social media, you get on it and if you're at a, you know, a place in life of like really sensitive, like, man, look at everybody. Their life is just awesome. Like they're doing everything. And that's why it's so important for me, even on my social media platforms, if somebody gets on, my pages or gets on my website or here's a story about me that doesn't know me personally. And the assumption is made. It's like, I want to be like him because he's just going and blowing and doing everything and always adventure to really tell the backstory. Like, Hey, all of that is great. And all of that is good, but it's not my primary focus because ultimately I could be doing that. And on the backside, I could have an awful relationship with my wife. I could have awful community with people. And if that's the case, then like, what, what, what good is that progression? Um, so it's just like telling them, Hey, that's great. But finding out what that looks like in your own personal life, it's not supposed to look just like everybody else's. Like you're your own unique, creative individual. Like there's adventure, whether it's a, a short little walk in the woods or whether it's going to get coffee at a coffee, whatever it may be. Um, right, but see, see, that's the flip side, <laughs> the challenge of social media. Right. Absolutely. You know, like, like I, I, you know, just like everybody else, we all go through ups and downs and horrible moments and boring moments, right. and, you know, but we're not going to put our horrible, boring moments, right. photos, because you, you know, like you, I, I like my photos to look good. Right, right. You know, I want, I want it <laughs> yeah. to look stylized in a certain way. And then, yeah. and then, you know, so I'm not going to put garbage sure. on my social media account sure. intentionally, Yeah, you know, so it is, it is a challenge. It is, man. And even, you know, working, so a lot of social media has became such a, a business platform. Um, so even for in the creative space, a professional photographer, a lot of the work we post is more so to promote our work rather right. than necessarily the the lifestyle we're living um, or, you know, how great our life is. And so that even has been a struggle for me of learning how to be transparent and authentic in that of like, yeah, I, I have the ability and a lot of my work is taking professional photography, creating professional work. And and with social media, that's what a lot of it is, visual graphics and motion and still photography and all that. Um, so learning how to still deploy that and share that with people, but through words expressing whether it's the story that goes with it, whether it's, hey, I was taking this photo and this is what it means to me because I was at a place in my life that I was just really struggling and here's the lesson that I learned in it or whatever it may be. You know, that's... All right, um, you do a great job with that. I think what I'm going to do is going forward, I'm just going to borrow part of that. I'm going to say <laughs> hashtag um, living... 
um, slowly with purpose. I I'm just gonna you, add. I'm gonna get a. I'm gonna get a tattoo of that also. I See, you, I'm dude. gonna copy you. I dig um, it. So talk a little bit about your faith. You yeah. mentioned your faith while ago, and I know that's important to yeah, you. Yeah, man. Tell me about that. Absolutely. So um, I'm follower of Jesus Christ, and that has, you know, it's so crazy. The progression of my life. I was raised up in the church, um, and I'm so thankful for that. But also that doesn't guarantee uh, your admission into heaven. And so as as I've grown up, I was saved. I had an understanding and uh, a knowledge that okay, Jesus, I believe you're real. Jesus, I believe that you're Lord and Savior of my life. And just as so much as that commitment in that moment was real, living the life of being a Christian is not that your life is perfect. It's not that everything gets easy. It's not that nothing bad happens to you. And also, it's not that you're exempt from temptation and doing whatever the heck you want and whenever you want and all that. So even as I grew up, there's so many moments that I would draw away from God and give in to the selfish desires of, man, I want to go be the cool guy, whatever it may be. So even as I progressed into middle school, high school, into college, probably the biggest catalyst season of my life and and within my faith and within my walk with Jesus um, and my intimacy with God, not only as Lord, as like, God, you are sovereign creator, but also like, hey, you're my daddy and you're my father and I love you so much, was my sophomore year in college at UT Martin. Um, I was at such a like, just a state of confusion, like, God, through the Holy Spirit, I know you're calling me to be a leader and to live my life this one way, but yet I I feel the draw. I feel the power of doing whatever I want, of just going hard, partying, doing all that. Um, and my brother-in-law, uh, which is probably the, one of the biggest spiritual mentors in my whole life, um, he walked with me through that season of learning what it looks like to embrace the wild heart that I have as a man, but also to embrace how fun, not, not just fun. And that, that kind of does it injustice, how freeing, like being obedient and being faithful to God is because the misconception is, okay, why would I want to serve a God? Why would I want to live for the God that sucks all the fun out of my life? That tells me what to do. That tells me the way to do it. On the flip side, my, you know, learning in my perspective is that God wants what's, he doesn't tell us whether it's through commandments. He doesn't tell us to live our lives in these certain ways because he wants to suck the fun at like, he wants to enhance our opportunity in life, not to just experience it, but to, to be in communion with him. Because that's out of anything I've done, whether as people look on my social media, whatever it may be, the greatest thing I've ever experienced in life is having a relationship with Jesus and being in communion with God. Um, because a lot of my like my creativity, a lot of my ability to do the work that I do is not that I was good enough or not that I worked hard enough for it. Like It's just something that I know God has given me the ability to do, to bring glory to Him um, and whatever platform I'm doing. Um, and so that's, uh, that's really fish for folks. Um, and in Matthew, all throughout the gospel, you tell Jesus, uh, Jesus tells me, you know, go, go forth and fish for people. Um, so my ambition to fish for, fish for folks is to tell people what Jesus means to me, tell people the gospel, um, how in need I am because I could have a perfect life perfect everything, but the reality is that doesn't, you know, there's something more to this life. Um, and I want people to live for eternity with God rather than live for eternity in hell. Um, and so that's kind of the the greater purpose to all that I do. And it, and it manifests itself in the future. You've got future plans. Yeah. Um, what, what's, what's up for Seth and Heather Dorch yeah, in man. the future? So we, uh, gosh, it's been, honestly, it's just been wild, crazy. Um, we, the church that we serve at right now, Soul Quest Church in Jackson, Tennessee, we, uh, we've moved back there. So when, when we left from Crosswind, uh, which was hard in itself, Crosswind is just such a great community led by great leadership that has such a heart for, for God and for people. Um, one of the pastors there, Austin, he approached us, I guess it was probably about 
five months ago of, of a potential church plant in Knoxville, Tennessee. And there's been, there's so much backstory to that. Even a lot of no's for me in my career. Um, I, there was, within 2019 has just been crazy for me career-wise of different opportunities um, that have either been opened or closed, but that, that have all led me to the point of just surrendering uh, even my idea of what my career should look like to say, all right, God, like, You've given me the abilities. You know the plan you have for me, declares. You know you promised me that, and so I'm just going to heed to that and trust in you in that. So, in this the spring of, of 2020, we'll be relocating to the to the Knox County region to help uh, plant a church there. It's not we're not like paid sat, you know, not but just leadership volunteer role um, and helping them grow and implant themselves into that community and learning how to help people find Jesus. If they're not Christians, um, if, if they don't know Jesus, teaching, like sharing the gospel with them. If they are, discipling them and teaching them how to um, not just live a good life, like, but to live a life that is just real and, and what regards to God calls us to, to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received. Um, because we're only here for a short time. Like just as so much as I want to really live and embrace this life, reality is it's just fleeting. Like it, it's here today and gone tomorrow. Um, and so how can, you know, Bob Goff, he, he, he said a quote on a podcast. I don't know if it was if he was doing it with Miles Adcox that I was listening to, but he said, "I, I want to be rem- I want to be known for doing a lot of activity, um, but I want to be remembered." Um, and he was talking about of being really connective with people, and you know, I want to be known for whether it's being the best in in my career that I do, um, whether it's being re- like creative. I want to be known for those things, but I want to be remembered for actually like investing in people and helping people's lives become better and more so just glorifying the name of Jesus. Say, you know, when people hear the name Seth Dortch, if they would think of a a man of God, uh, a heart that is for the Lord, then I'm totally cool with that. Um, So that's kind of the, the ambition there. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, here man. Today. Thank, dude, this I, was incredible. We'll have to do another one. I love it, man. Every <laughs> once in a while, you meet somebody yeah. and you know, like I'm going to be friends with well, that man, guy. Here, and the minute I met you, I was like, we're so, going to be friends. When when Katie texts me, like seriously, so personally, I have so much appreciation for not only Discovery Park as an organization, um, but being able to know so many of y'all individually as the team is just so awesome. Like y'all are so unique and so passionate about the work y'all are doing. And then on the flip side, being able to experience that for working with Final Flight and being a partner with Discovery Park has been cool from the business aspect of it. Um, and man, I'm just so thankful to know you, to know all of y'all and just to to get to be around y'all, to be a sponge, to learn from y'all of not only how you grow in your personal lives, like as you're pushing the limits in your careers with your families, whatever it may be. And then on the flip side with Discovery Park, helping people, you know, helping people see beyond and bring creativity and imagination back to adults um, that has been sucked out in so many years and then providing opportunity for children, whether it's through the exhibits, whether it's coming to see the place, like, and engaging with them, dude, just, it stokes me up. So I'm thankful for you guys and thankful for the work that y'all do and thankful for you, man, for your investment in me. Well, well, don't be a stranger <laughs> and we're going to have you back <laughs> next year cool. after you've had some time to set up. You know, they don't have ducks in that part of the country. I'm, I'm they, sorry about that. They do have a lot of fly fishing though. So they, oh, yeah. they do have fly fishing. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, uh, it, there's, there's a pro and con to each season. So <laughs> I, I'll definitely be coming back to West Tennessee to hunt a bunch of ducks. Excellent. Well, when you're back, we'll have you on, you know, cool. the podcast again to get an update. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And now, let's go find out a little bit more behind the scenes at Discovery Park of America. Hello, I'm Andrew Gibson with the Education Department here at beautiful Discovery Park of America. And today, I'm with Casey Workman, who is the Assistant Director of the Aquarium and Wildlife here. And she's going to be telling us more about one of my personal favorite exhibits we have. One that strikes up a lot of questions every time I see a kiddo run by it. Uh, So, Casey... What are we going to talk about today? 
Today, we're going to talk about the three-toed amphiuma. A lot of people don't know how to pronounce that, and they're not quite sure what they're looking at when they walk up on it. It can look like an eel to some people. It might look like a water snake to some people. But if you look a little bit closer, you'll see that this guy actually has legs. They're very small, but they are there. And of course, on each foot, there is three toes. So he is actually a fully aquatic salamander. Now, Casey, what does a fully aquatic salamander eat? He is actually a top predator in his environment. That is unusual for most people to hear because he is a salamander. Their favorite food is the biggest crayfish they can find. However, they are going to eat whatever they can get their mouth on. So they have been known to eat crayfish, small fish, worms. They have been found with snapping turtle young in their belly. So you don't want to run across one of these guys. Obviously, they do have a powerful bite if they can eat that much. Now, when you're saying snapping turtles, the one we have on display, he's not very big. He can't eat a snapping turtle. Um, do they get any larger or? So he is not fully grown. They are able to reach lengths of about three feet. So they are one of our largest salamanders here in the state. Now you said in the state. Uh, this guy is not exotic. He he's not from some some you know unique rainforest you know in, in Brazil or, or anything like that. He he's, you can find him in Tennessee. Absolutely. So one of the best places you can find these guys is actually right down the road at Real Foot Lake. Back in 2010, there was a study done where they used 29 amphiumas that they found in the Kiwanis Slough, which is found right next to the new cabins down there. So if you're looking for an exotic looking animal you could go out there and trap these well casey like i said thank you so much for coming out uh telling us more about the three-toed amphiuma uh, and his name is noodle correct noodle uh, and so. he has a, a girlfriend named panay okay <laughs> so come out to discovery park meet noodle uh we, we hope to see you here at discovery park real soon thank you for listening to real foot forward if you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.